Seven weeks ago, we started our Road to Calvary series at the Mount of Transfiguration, where we found Moses and Elijah, who represented the Old Testament law and the prophets, discussing with Jesus the greatest event in history, his departure in Jerusalem, the cross. And as Jesus was revealed in his true glory, we heard the Father speaking from heaven about his Son. This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And he was telling the three disciples to listen to Jesus, because Jesus through the cross was about to fulfill the law and the prophets and supersede everything that had gone before. And then we watched him arrive in Jerusalem to the adulation of the fickle crowd. An unlikely king riding on a donkey rather than on a white horse, as you might expect. And only a few days later, we see that same crowd baying for his blood. And then we travelled to a village in Jerusalem called Bethany, where we saw Jesus portrayed as worthy of everything most precious. As we watched a grateful and adoring and weeping Mary do a beautiful thing and pour out her very precious ointment on his feet in preparation for his burial. Soon afterwards we were ushered into the upper room to watch the disciples taking the Passover meal where Jesus revealed himself as Christ our Passover. The Lamb who would bring forgiveness and an amazing new agreement through the shedding of his own blood and the breaking of his own body. And then we saw him washing their feet, revealing the nature of God as humble and gentle instead of proud and loving instead of selfish and illustrating our need to humbly and continually receive his cleansing and power in order to be part of his project and then to serve others in the same way. I remember a few years ago seeing that the cross was not only an event in history that Jesus accomplished, but that the spirit of the cross was always in Jesus. It was like uh, the shoulders and the spine of the human body kind of hold up um, <clears throat> the body in some way. And you could kind of see that spirit of Christ all the way through his life. From the time when in his childhood he said to his mother, I must be about my father's business. And when he said to his followers, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Someone has described the cross that we carry as where our will is crossed by God's will. But Jesus always chose his Father's will above his own. The spirit of Calvary ran through his veins. Last week, Mauricio showed us in the Garden of Gethsemane this very point. We saw Jesus as so human, honestly saying that he didn't want to drink that cup of the wine of his Father's righteous anger and asking his Father if there was any other way this could be accomplished and then bowing his will to the will of the Father and saying, not my will, but yours be done and choosing to drink the cup. This is where the battle was won, in prayer, that is in honest communication. Jesus was so honest about the way he felt, honest communication with his Father and then making the right choice. And having made the right choice, we read that afterwards the angels came and strengthened him. There's a lesson here for us. As we face our challenges, let us spend time with God. Let's be honest with him about our challenges and he'll help us to make the right choice. And we'll receive grace for the journey. The disciples slept when they should have prayed and they failed. Jesus prayed and succeeded.
So now we're at Calvary looking at Jesus who has been tempted in every way, just like us, yet without sin. The proven, perfect, spotless Lamb of God, now dying in the place of countless sinful men and women, including you and including me. We're joining the scene at midday, halfway through this six-hour ordeal. Already Jesus has been falsely accused, falsely judged, mocked, spat at and beaten up so that his face is unrecognisable. Whipped within an inch of his life, nailed, probably naked, to a cross and bearing a crown of thorns thrust down upon his head. Unimaginable pain. The crucifixion was the longest and most excruciatingly uh, and painful form of execution that the Romans could think up. I mention these things um, because the Bible mentions them. And obviously God wanted us to be aware of the horrific sufferings of the cross. Why did it have to be so brutal? Have you ever thought that? Why did it have to be so painful physically, mentally? emotionally. Maybe because Jesus wanted us to know that in his love he suffered every kind of pain that human beings would go through, yet without giving up. Maybe because he wanted us to know um, how much he loved us. Certainly that is true. For greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And then, at midday, something remarkable begins to happen. The sky begins to cloud over until a deep darkness falls upon the whole land. This was recorded by a Roman historian called Phlegon. He said there was an extraordinary eclipse of the sun at the sixth hour. The day turned into dark night so that the stars in heaven were seen and there was an earthquake. And now we hear Jesus crying out these incredible words, which are written in Hebrew. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or as we might say, why have you abandoned me? Abandonment, rejection. That feeling of being alone, having once been closely bonded, is a terrible thing. The psychological effects of abandonment are well known to a psychologist, but none of us enjoy that feeling of being let down by people we trust, by, be feeling, by feeling abandoned by people we are close to, rejected by people we respect. Jesus had already been betrayed by Judas abandoned by his disciples, disowned by Peter and rejected by the crowd. But what is happening uh, now is far worse to him. Let's just consider that in all eternity up to this point, Jesus had never been separated from his Father. And the fellowship he had enjoyed with the Father and the Holy Spirit was of a depth that we can only imagine. The greatest and most joyful friendships um, that you have ever seen or I have ever seen or experienced are only a shadow of the fellowship enjoyed by the Godhead. We get an inkling of this in the book of Proverbs, which says this in chapter 8, describing the sun at the dawn of creation. Then I was beside him, like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. And when Jesus speaks to his father, he doesn't speak in grand, formal, distant words. He calls him Abba Father. Daddy God is the nearest we get to it. Informal, affectionate, close. And in his earthly walk, Jesus utterly depended on his Father. He was in constant communion with him. 
He never did anything he didn't see his father doing, and he never said anything he didn't hear his father saying. They walked together. And then at the baptism of Jesus, as the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove on the Son. The Father says, as he did on the Mount of Transfiguration, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Or as one translation puts it, This is my Son, the dearly loved, in whom is my delight. Whenever we hear the audible voice of the Father in the Gospels, we hear these same words, Beloved, Son, Delighted. John summed it up in the first words of his Gospel. He said, In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. God. Amazing. He was always with him. He was never apart from him. And this withness is the relationship that God has planned to have with you and I. In Genesis 1 verse 26, this three in one God says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So the three in one creates a two in one who would fill the earth with this incredible example of harmony. Genesis 1.27 says this, So God created man in his own image. The image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And unlike the animals that were uh, not created to fellowship with God, we were created as spiritual beings, as God breathed into us the breath of life. Like Enoch, we would be individual beings that could walk with God. But they gave it all away. Satan was given a choice. And he had separated himself from the unity of the angelic host and was allowed onto this earth to give us a choice. And we too chose to rebel. And the worst part of the curse that fell upon us at that time was the curse of separation. As Isaiah said, your sins have separated you and God. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, separated from the perfection and beauty of God, from his purpose and provision, from love and joy and peace. But most of all, they were separated from God himself. The God and his love would not allow this separation to continue. And even as Adam and Eve received their judgment, a saviour is promised. A lamb was set apart to take the punishment on himself. And he shall bruise your head, God said to the serpent. And so this is what we are seeing happen now on Calvary. Maybe this is the point where, as the prophet Isaiah put it, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because somewhere in this six-hour crucifixion, that is exactly what happened. Spurgeon says that the darkness is the symbol of the wrath of God which fell on those who slew his only begotten son. God was angry and his frown removed the light of day. Others have thought that the father didn't, couldn't bear to look upon the suffering of his son. Others have explained the darkness, quoting Habakkuk, You are of purer eyes than to see evil, and you cannot look at wrong. But one thing we can be sure of is that Jesus felt abandoned by his father because our sin was being laid upon him. And then we reach the pinnacle of the story. At the end of the six hours, Jesus cries out, It is finished. The Greek word tetelestai means paid in full. This is because Jesus had fully paid the debt of sin he owed. 
and he finished the eternal purpose of the cross. And you know then something else remarkable happens. It says as Jesus uttered a loud cry, breathed his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple separated man from the presence of God, except the high priest just once a year. And it was thought to be a, a hand breadth thick, that's about nine centimetres. So it was impossible, like, a, like two or three telephone directories, to, for a human being to rip through that. And just to make the point, it says that God tore the uh, veil from the top to the bottom. And this veil was 60 feet high. And all this so that you and I could be with God and God could be with us. As Paul said in Romans 5.10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. I'd like to finish this morning by um, trying to answer that question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the famous uh, Victorian preacher, uh, said this. He said, we can imagine the answer to Jesus's question, why? Because, my son, you have chosen to stand in the place of guilty sinners. You who have never known sin have made the infinite sacrifice to become sin and receive my just wrath upon sin and sinners. You do this because of your great love and because of my great love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you, Father, that we have been reconciled to you by the blood of your Son. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus and allowing this to happen. Jesus, thank you for saying yes in the garden. Thank you, Lord. Help us to enjoy the fellowship that you have opened up to be praying people, Lord. And Lord Jesus, could you help us to be ministers of this reconciliation and empower us and equip us, Lord, as you open our eyes to it, to share this good news with others. Amen.